He is the creator and sustainer of all the worlds, whether those worlds are known or unknown to mankind. unclouded by hate does not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice hello everyone my name's charlie you might know me better as sci-fi fantasy writer c.e dorset and today i wanted to start a conversation the topic that we're going to be talking about what does a modern faith look like i'm not really going to be providing a definitive answer in this episode for several reasons. One, I'm not sure that there is a definitive answer to that or any similar question. But mainly because I think it's something that we need to start talking about in a very broad way. So before we get started, if you haven't already, and the app that you're listening to me on allows you to rate either this episode or this podcast, please do so. That helps out a bunch. It tells the algorithm to share the podcast with more people. And that would be a wonderful thing. So the question is one of the reasons why I put the podcast on hiatus. Because I grew up, okay, I don't like it when this podcast is about me. But I think I kind of have to open up a little bit about my past here. I grew up in quite a few Baptist, non-denominational churches. Some of my earliest memories of religion have to do with a congregation being ripped in half because of controversies surrounding the pastor, and my family was on his side. And so the church ripped in half, and we left the beautiful building that we used to worship in, and actually started having services in a, I believe it was a Holiday Inn back then. Um, they had a banquet hall in the basement, which is where we had church services. They actually rented out a couple different um, hotel rooms around the building that we had our um, Sunday school in. And my family moved around quite a bit, and so we attended several different churches, be they Baptist or non-denominational. The one thing that they had in common is they were all conservative and fundamentalist. I grew up watching televangelists on TV buying their books, reading their books, and accepting what they had to say as if it were the gospel truth. When I was about 16, a great aunt of mine exposed me to Catholicism. And through a series of events that I would rather not discuss right now, I ended up in my adult life converting to Catholicism where I remained happily for quite some time after moving to California um, for re reasons that, again, I just don't want to go into because I don't want to get too sidetracked. In this episode, we started attending an Episcopal church in Berkeley, and for the first time, I heard about the work of Matthew Fox and... I finished reading prayer the week before 9-11 happened. And my response to that tragedy was to go to the local Borders bookstore and buy every book that I could find by Matthew Fox, because that book said everything that I thought religion should be. And thus I got involved with creation spirituality. 
And that kind of brings us to where we are today. And I want to be specific that when I'm what I'm talking about today is not so much what should the church look like, what should the modern church look like, or what should modern religion look like. It's what should modern faith look like? Because I don't think we, the faithful, discuss that enough. I see a lot of atheists, agnostics, and New Agers discussing that to a great degree, usually settling on the side that we should either reject it or be completely postmodern in our way of thinking. Fundamentalists discuss this a lot too, and they come to the place where we have to just rely on the old time religion. Nothing can change. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So we just hold to all of our old prejudices and do things the way we've always done things, even when that doesn't appear to be working. And people like me, especially people who participate in creation spirituality, we have, it seems like just from the few that I've met, we have a split personality when it comes to this. Because there's part of us that wants to look back to the ancient, to the old, to the tradition, to that wisdom tradition that was lost. It's one of the reasons why we often in our small community here don't talk about going to church. We talk about going to Kahal because Kahal means assembly in um, Hebrew. And it's actually the root word for Koleth, which is what the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes calls himself when it says the preacher, the Hebrew word there is Koleth and it means the assembler. And because so much of our faith and practice comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, it only makes sense that we talk about the assembly or the Kahal. But that's neither here nor there. Because that's still talking about institutions. That's still talking about groups. I, I really find this topic fascinating because I know many people of various faiths and of none. And they all know that I am a person of deep faith. And so we have these discussions all the time. But I don't see those of us who are within any of these movements actually talking about this out loud. When I say, what does faith look like? What does modern faith look like? When I was a kid, faith was unquestioned. The Bible said it. I believe it. And that's just the way that it is. When I converted to Catholicism, the church says it, <laughs> I believe it, and that's just the way that it is. That model is not only under question today, but I think dangerous. Because so many people have learned the power that religion can have over people, and so Almost every dastardly plan that you see from pyramid schemes to bizarre sex cults to, you know, Scientology and the rest use the apparatus, the terminology of religion to develop faith in their followers so that they can get away with whatever it is that they're, they're wanting to get away with the manipulation and the harm that they want to do, that they want to accomplish, the money they want to siphon from their followers, the power they want to have over people. And that's where I think we really have to discuss what faith is and where it comes from and what it means for us. Paul Tillich gave me my personal mantra when it comes to faith. And he said that faith is belief in the ultimate. And for something to be worthy of that faith, it must demonstrate itself to be ultimate. And then spends about 200 pages discussing the concept of ultimate. But in effect, what he's saying is faith is something that cannot reside in a person because a person is finite. What is ultimate must be infinite. It must be 
transcendent. It must be greater than. So one could not and should not ever put their faith in an image, in a book, in a person, in a teacher, in a relationship, in a community, because all of those things are finite. And in that finite, in that finite state, are liable for to be corrupted and to be in error. And that the only faith that matters is the faith that we have in that ultimate being, that ultimate one. The God that I pray to, the God that I worship, is beyond words. When I, when I name my God, Ha Elohim, it's not a magic phrase. It's not a holy term that I can say and invoke some ancient spirit. It is a word that my mind can have access to so I can talk about the ultimate. So I can talk about that which is beyond my faculties to understand. And this is the problem that we have with faith is we allow ourselves to have faith in our beliefs, to have faith in people, in institutions, in documents. We are supposed to have faith in God alone. Even when Jesus walked the earth, he told people not to worship him, for we should worship only one, and that is our Father who is in heaven. When a man came to Jesus and said, good rabbi, and Jesus said, no, why, why do you call me good? There is none good under the sun except, f f except for our father who is in heaven. And that's Jesus talking. This is the Jesus that the scriptures themselves says is sinless, is blameless, that we believe is sinless and blameless. But he says that while in his mortal form, no one should call him good. Well, if Jesus wasn't worthy of being called good and being worshipped in this world, then no human, no institution, no group, no document is worthy of worship in this world. Because all of them are liable to corruption and distortion and abuse. And I think we've witnessed this so often in so many different ways through news stories of groups like the Mormon fundamentalists in Utah or the story of Jim Jones or the religious charismatic nature that Hitler brought to Germany or that developed in Al Qaeda or Daesh. And we see the power of these religious charismatic people to create groups that are willing to do anything, harm each other, harm others, kill themselves, kill others because of their faith. And this has led a lot of people to reject faith altogether. And as someone who is a person of faith, as someone who is very devoted to the life of faith. I don't think simply abandoning it is the answer. But I do think the answer starts with us being very clear that, like Jesus before us, our kingdom is not of this world. We're not trying to have land here. We're not trying to put up all of our treasures here in this world. We're not conquerors here. We are not worshipping anyone in this world, for no one under the sun is good. And when we allow those thoughts to come into our minds, and to permeate us, and become roots to our faith, we are doing our best to immunize ourselves from any allegiance that would distract us from God, 
any allegiance that would distract us from the good work that we are here on this world to do. Because we're not here to serve individuals. We're here to serve everyone. I say it enough on this podcast that people are probably getting tired of hearing me say it, but I want to say it again (laughs) because I think it's important. God is not a respecter of persons. We are not meant to be respecters of persons either. Our goal is not to be followers. Our goal is not to be leaders. We are to be equal. Jesus, who we believe To be God incarnate, who did not think it was robbery to consider himself equal with God, washed the feet of his disciples. He lowered himself to a servant. The first shall be last, Jesus tells us, and the last shall be first. And that is the model that we are here to follow. We are here to help one another not to bow our heads to someone greater than us, because we are all equal. We are equal in dignity, and we are equal in the sight of God. But faith deals with so much more than just how we deal with the people around us, from the teachers we listen to, to the books that we read. It deals with how we cope with our beliefs and how we hold them because faith is belief to so many people. And I, I'm always amazed when I tell somebody that I am a Christian and they look at me and they say, do you actually believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? Yes. Yes. And then they start attacking me with what they think are scientific proofs that will dissuade me from the beliefs that I have. But the problem is, I do not hold these beliefs dogmatically. And I do not hold these beliefs, I do not have this faith, because reason convinced me. I have this faith because I believe in my heart that I have encountered the risen Christ. I believe that in my heart, Jesus was born of a virgin because he was different from all of us. He was separated from our original wound. He didn't possess that inclination to darkness that we have. And in his perfection, he perfected the world. Yes, I believe all of those things. Now, If you were to find me definitive proof that he was the child of Mary and Joseph, I don't know what that proof would be, but that doesn't shake my belief at all in the virgin birth. Because the virgin birth means exactly what it says in scripture. Unto you a child will be born, and he shall be called Christ the Lord. And you will name him Jesus, for he will save his people. That is the power of the virgin birth. And so I'm not tied to the literal nature of any of these things. But I don't, I don't question them either. Because it doesn't matter. We can't prove one way or another events that happened 2000 years ago. And I don't think it's productive for us to argue about those points. It really doesn't work for me. If you don't have a relationship with the risen Lord Jesus, if you have never felt that knocking on our heart and that whisper to let him in, if, as our Quaker sisters and brothers say, the divine light hasn't shined within you, shone within you, and awakened you to the divine There's nothing I can say. There's literally nothing that I can say or do that will change your mind. But in sitting and waiting on the Lord, I have found that he will renew our strength. He will give us life and life more abundant. Now, 
just because I've said what I've said, it sounds like I'm very rigid in my beliefs. But I'm not. And I don't think we're meant to be. See, I can talk to you about pretty much anything that you want to talk about, religiously speaking. I've got quite a broad experience of religion. I've tried many things in my life. I've studied, and I believe in deep ecumenism, which means you try to find the truth wherever you can find it. Several people have given us um, statues of Ganesh, and I have them. We have one at our business, and I have one in the house. I'm looking at it right now as I'm recording this. And I am not a devotee of Ganesh. I do not worship Ganesh. I am not a Hindu. But I know the story, the energies that Ganesh represents, and I am not willing to throw those out of my life. <laughs> but it's not polytheism. I am not polytheistic in the slightest. But I do think that you can find God in most things. And I look at my beliefs and I find them personally to be quite flexible. You will hear me talk about the Buddha and the Buddha nature and the pure land as much as you hear me talk about the kingdom of our father. And I see actually a slight difference in terminology between the two. And I think we've talked about that on previous episodes and we'll probably talk about it in future ones. But these are beliefs that I have found through faith because faith leads to effort. Effort leads to mindfulness. Mindfulness leads to concentration. Concentration leads to wisdom and wisdom leads to faith. This is actually something I learned from Buddhism. These are the five strengths that animate us. They're the five powers that awaken us. And one leads to the next, which leads to the next in this endless cycle. And to me, that's what faith is. Faith is the beginning of the process. The goal is wisdom. But wisdom leads to more questions. The questions lead to more faith. That faith leads to effort. That effort leads to mindfulness. That mindfulness to concentration. That concentration to wisdom. And then the cycle begins again and again and again. And it's never finished. And it's always new. And it's ever changing. And this is the model for faith that I've found in my own life that I practice and that I preach that I'm talking to you about right now, seeing faith as part of the process. And you can find this in the Bible itself. Faith is the beginning. Faith leads to the fruit of the spirit. Faith leads us down the path of righteousness. Faith is the beginning. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It is not the end. And as we walk the path, and as we look through the eyes that faith gives us, as we look through the eyes that this new faith has given us, we learn, one, that our faith cannot be dead. Like James said, faith without works is dead. Faith leads to effort. If your faith is not motivating you to action, then your faith is truly dead. My faith tells me that I should have compassion for all people, and so I try to help people to the best of my ability. And I can't... to the fullness of what I want, because I am neither wealthy nor am I powerful. <laughs> so some of the changes that I would love to see bring about in the world, I can only talk about and help others to see, but I can lend a shoulder. I can lend support. I can do what I can do to be helpful. And through that faith, there is effort. And through that effort, I grow in mindfulness and see the world as it is. And in that mindfulness, I gain further concentration. I focus on the things that are important and the things that are not fall away. I learn better every day, every month, every year, what is good and what I should be doing. And I push on in that. And that eventually leads to wisdom. And wisdom is hard to share. 
which is why anecdotes and stories are the best that we have. Because in those stories, we can share this wisdom. Wisdom that we've gained, wisdom that our ancestors have gained, wisdom that our community and other communities have gathered over the centuries and over the millennia. And in taking in that wisdom, we try. And in those trials, we build faith. Not every practice I thought should be part of my life built faith. Because when I applied faith and then effort, right? Here's a practice I might want to take on or a belief that I might want to take on. So here's my faith. Here's my effort. And in mindfulness, sometimes you learn that that's not the right thing. And so as part of focus and wisdom, you learn to let go of that. This is the glory of the four paths and knowing the four paths and how we walk amongst them. Sometimes we gather at home. Sometimes we let it go. Sometimes we create something new. And sometimes we transform and liberate what is before us. And this is the great path that we are all called to walk. It is not rigid. Yes, I still say my creeds. I do. But every time I say it, every day, it seems, as I grow in wisdom, the words mean different things to me. And so unlike John Shelby Spong, I can't say, well, I can't say God Almighty, because God doesn't cure all cancer, so how can God be Almighty? No, I I develop in my understanding of what it means to say God Almighty. And I'm not rigid like a fundamentalist in that, no, Almighty means Almighty, and that's just what it means. We grow in wisdom day by day. We don't hold rigidly to any one thing. The rigid reed is snapped by the wind. And we should move with it. Because the Holy Spirit is the great breath of God, breathed into the world. Chavrabino, our teacher, here to guide us to all truth. And in her loving arms we will find our way. She will remind us of all things that Christ has said, and teach us all the things that we could not bear to hear. And that is the purpose of the Holy Spirit, not to hold us back and prevent us from growing, but to propel us forward so that we are always growing for the glory of God, for the glory of the kingdom, and for the glory of the pure land, that we may love one another with all of our hearts as we love God. That's the great commandment. That's what we are here to do. And that's what we have to do. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this show. This is something I've been giving a lot of thought to over the years. And I think I got to a point where I could kind of say it in a way that made sense. And I hope it did. If you have a dollar or two, you could pass my way. That would be greatly appreciated. I I pay for everything myself down in the show notes or wherever the show notes are. You'll see a link for community support. If you click that link, you can give at the one, five or $10 a month levels. That helps me to do everything that I'm doing and helps me to know where to put my time, energy and focus to make this the best experience that I can for people. And thank you to everybody who does. That helps out a lot. If you don't have any money or you don't feel like giving right now, that is perfectly right. Trust me. I know what it feels like to be poor. I know. I live it every day. Um, But if you know anybody that you think would like this show, please share it with them. That helps out a lot. If you have any questions or comments, you can find me on Twitter. I'm Wisdom Cries Out on Twitter. Or you can go to wisdomscry.com and find a link to all of the social media and all of the resources that I put up there. And hopefully that will continue to grow as I have time to build it up over there. 
I want to thank you all for your patience and your support. And until next time, may God bless you and keep you ever growing in wisdom. Amen.